This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we continue in the book of Joel. Now, before we get started, as always, we need to make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity and the time and all that you've given us to study your word today. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open and receptive to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in Joel chapter 1, or the chapter for that matter, we've seen the prophet command the people to listen because he has an important lesson that needs to be learned for the generations. They should know that disobeying the covenant brings great discipline, and they are to see at this point what locusts can do to a land, to their crops, to their food, to their drink, even how it affects their worship services. Little is left in the land after Joel gets done with this part of his message, that's clear. And it's also clear that the nation is under discipline. <clears throat> it's in the latter sta stages of these cycles of discipline. And what they need to do and do it right away is to return to the Lord. To repent of their sin. Joel goes into some detail explaining what they need to do as individuals and as groups. But as bad as the locusts have been and as terrible as things are right now in the land, something much worse is on the verge of happening. It's much more than a locust invasion. The judgment event about to occur is called the Day of the Lord. A judgment from the Lord God that is like nothing they've ever seen before or experienced. Now we will just look at verse 15 as part of our review that brings us into the subject of the day of the Lord, and then we'll continue. Let's go back to verse 15. <clears throat> Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. And let me just give you a brief overview of the next three verses. Verse 16 will describe how this has an effect on the people's food supply, that is, the locust at this point. In verse 17, we start to see even the buildings, the barns, and so on fall apart. In verse 18, the animals are suffering. Now let's go back and look at verse 16 in some detail. In Joel 1.16, Joel raises a question that makes clear to the people the reality of the situation. Um, we might put it today this way. Can't you see it? It's right in front of your eyes. All right, verse 16. Has not food been cut off before your eyes, and gladness and joy from the house of our God? This was something clear to them. Now aren't they going to make the connection between what has happened and what they've done? But this is how bad things are. The people are facing the, the possibility of starvation. Without grain, uh, there's no grain for offerings, for worship. So the gladness and joy that would normally accompany the worship activities in the house of God, the temple, is gone. It's plain before their eyes what is happening. And yet, 
for those who are still blinded by the hardness of heart that refuse to see. Verse 17 describes the obvious even more. The seeds shrivel under the shovels or clods of earth. The storehouses lie desolate. The granaries have been broken down, for the grain has dried up. Let's look at the phrase, under their shovels or clods of earth. Now the reason I have these two different translations here is because there's a textual issue here. The Masoretic text actually says shovels. Some of the translations put in an alternate possible uh, translation by putting in clods, and that would refer to clods of earth. Though the actual word that they want to substitute is just clods. Uh, they also, the word shovel can mean hole or some sort of instrument. And basically what they're saying is that as they open up the ground with these uh, farm implements, we, we would call them, even though the seed drops in, it shrivels up because there's no water. So they prepared the land to receive water, but it can't get it. The description goes on to say the food storehouses are empty. The, granary, the granaries are broken down or dilapidated. Uh, buildings are being neglected because there's no use for anybody to go around them anymore. No grains, so no upkeep of the buildings. And at this point, it's clear that this, this is literal locust, by the way. Uh, Joel continued to describe how bad this local locust, locust infestation is. It's early morning, I'm not speaking too clearly. But the actual army of men has not yet invaded. Now, let me just go ahead and point this out because this can get a little confusing. In fact, I remember... We studied this passage in seminary, and that was one of the deep, big debates. Is this an actual uh, uh, locust invasion, or is it referred to men? Well, my understanding is, as I've studied this uh, the last few weeks, is that there is an actual locust invasion, and the people are basically standing there uh, looking at how devastating this evasion, invasion has been and how bad things have become, but yet it's just a picture of what is much worse to come. So you're going to see Joel seemingly jump back and forth between the locusts and the army, but if you look at the terms closely and the verbs, I think you'll come to the same conclusion. This is actually a locust invasion he's describing now, but anticipating an actual major army invasion that the locust invasion pictures on a smaller scale. And yet you look at this smaller scale and see how devastating it is. Well, there's just not much room left for damage except the people and the temple. So, I think it's clear that the locust invasion is going on or has went on and that the actual army is about to invade. Because this passage does describe a loss of crops and food by locusts. Verse 18 gives us the situation with the animals. How the cattle groan, the herds of livestock wander around in confusion because there is no pasture for them even the flocks of sheep are suffering so here we continue to see even the suffering of animals because a lack of grain a lack of food the herds of livestock wander around in confusion the hebrew word book means be perplexed, they're confused. Uh, 
we see how the animals are affected, not only the cattle, but the livestock in general, the sheep. They're starving, they're thirsty, nothing to eat, uh, no feeding, no grass or grain. In fact, they can probably sense that if this keeps up, they shall die. You can just see them out there wandering around for food, going from one pasture to the next, confused because there's none here, there's none there. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. In verse 19, Joel himself begins to lament. Here we see him get in the picture, stepping in, calling to the Lord for help. To you, Lord, I cry for help. For fire has consumed the grassy pastures of wilderness, and the flame has burned up all the trees of the field. So Joel personally cries out to the Lord for help. The Lord must help. No one else can. He brought the discipline, so he must lift it. There are two things we should see here, and that we will see again and again. First is that it is the Lord's judgment. It is him that Joel goes to. He is the one who can help. And secondly, we will see the term fire, flame, burn, related terms to fire, and often judgment in Scripture is referred to as some sort of fire, fiery judgment, or fire itself. And that's what we have here. So sometimes it's difficult to tell whether well, there's actual fire. I think there's actual fire at times, but at the same time, keep in mind that whether it's just using the term for fire to refer to judgment or it's an actual fire, that it is judgment. And now from here through the next verse, Joel repeats the terrible things that are happening. He says the fields of crops are gone. No food for man or animal. The locust attack was followed by drought, followed by devastating fires on the fields. It doesn't take much to burn a field with a lightning strike or a small spark of some type. The trees burned up here would include the orchards, the fig trees, the olive trees, the fruit trees, and so on. So, in a plea, Joel reminds the Lord of how the animals are being affected in verse 20. So he continues. Even the beasts of the field, the wild animals, long for you, for food and water. For the streams, that's the sources of water, have dried up. For fire has consumed the grassy pastures of wilderness. The interesting word long for, the animals, the wild animals, the field animals are longing for you, indicating longing for the Lord. The word is a rag. It means to pant, as a deer pants for water. Long for, that's the idea. So Joel brings in the animals and how they are so suffering that they long for the Lord. Now, of course, animals have no spiritual senses, but they do have instinct and, of course, physical needs. And they sense something really missing here. No water. Their provision is gone. Things are not normal. We have a couple of cats that romp around in our house and Sometimes they entertain us and sometimes they hassle us, but the kids love them and I kind of do, but I love them because the kids love them, let's put it that way. But uh, when the kids are gone, they act differently. If we get out of our routine, they begin to make extra noise or extra movement or walking around wondering what's going on. 
and they sense that something has changed. I remember when I had a dog that when I would move, uh, she would pick up on the fact that I was packing boxes and she would get anxious because, well, did she really think I was going to leave her behind? But I think she kind of got anxious and excited because she knew that there was going to be a change. It happened uh, a few times in her lifetime. But animals do have a sense of change. And we see here that animals are sensing that there's no water coming. And I expect they were getting quite anxious. They go to the stream, it's dried up. They go to the river, it's dried up. They go to the pond, it's gone. So they go back and forth from place to place and there's nothing there. And then we see that fire has consumed the grassy pastures. Well, that is the source of food for many herds and flocks. They go to one pasture, it's burned down. They go to another one, it's dried up. And then we see that they long for the Lord himself. That's the way of saying that the Lord is the source of this curse. It's the source that would normally bring uh, grassy pasture and water to these creatures. And now they're not getting it. We see the repetition of the line here in this verse, for fire has consumed the grassy pastures. We saw that earlier. The use of this term fire also points again to the idea of judgment from the Lord, who we see in Scripture often judges with fire. As we move into chapter 2, we get closer to the description of the invasion of an actual army, but at the same time, we still see it through the picture of locusts. I thought about how I could illustrate this. Let's do it this way. This is us looking, okay? So we're looking through a set of lenses, okay? If you wear glasses, it's easy to imagine. But we see it through locusts. They see locusts, and then they see an actual human army when we look at this passage. So that's the kind of way to look at it. It's, we, they see the locusts, but through that they see a real army, a real potential as we get into the description of the locusts. And what Joel does is he describes the locusts as an army in some detail, in fact. So both of these things are going on at the same time, and keep that in mind as we get into chapter 2. Does that kind of picks up the pace a little bit or steps it up, you might say, to the future reality of the situation if things don't change. Verse 2 starts out with an alarm, an alarm to the people. In those days they used trumpets. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. Now if we were to go back to our lenses, we put the day of the Lord written under the army. Because when the army comes to invade, the day of the Lord is happening. The word for trumpet here is one you've probably heard of before. In, in Hebrew terms, the shofar, it's a ram's horn made into a trumpet-like instrument. It was used to call the people for communal celebration, Numbers 10, 1 through 10, or to alarm, to warn them of danger, like a military invasion, Ezekiel 33, 2 and 4. So we see the fact that he calls to blow the trumpet. Now, would they do that for a locust invasion? I doubt that. 
but if they to blow it for a military invasion, that would mean for the uh, the trained men to man their post, to prepare the defenses, to grab their weapons, whatever was called for to defend their cities. The phrase, and sound an alarm, let me put the verse back up there, <clears throat> to shout, to alert the people, the troops to get ready for what is coming. And notice it was sounded as to be sounded on my holy mountain. We see that again. That's Mount Zion, the place of the capital of Jerusalem, the heartbeat of the nation. If we were to go over and look at Zephaniah as we can in so many of these prophets and see such parallel activities and messages and phrases and so on. In Zephaniah 1.16, he starts to describe, well, actually he, he, he mentions day of the Lord in 1.7. Let's go to that. Zephaniah 1.7, be silent before the Lord. There we have a combination of Adonai, Yahweh. And when they use, here's, here's, let me just try to briefly explain this. This depends on your translation, but what happens is they come across the word Adonai, which is usually translated Lord. All right? But then you have the word Yahweh, which is usually translated Lord with all four capital letters. So what they do, and to me this is confusing. Some of your translations do this. They change the first, Lord, the first word that would normally be translated Lord to Sovereign. Then the one that's usually translated capital letters Lord, they change it to Lord with just an uppercase first letter, like I have it here. That's why I put in the translation. Now this combination of two words happens occasionally. And some of them will change and use the word God, which makes it even more confusing. So you have to read at the introduction of your particular translation how they translate these words for God. So that's why I inserted the actual Hebrew here. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. Now this is in Zephaniah, as he's going to describe the day of the Lord. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those he has invited. Notice this. He set them apart. This is an important part to remember. Because as believers, when these disasters hit, we are in the Lord's protection. Now, I don't know if I'd describe it as a protective bubble because I can't Imagine this wouldn't affect us. Just the sights and sounds alone would be rather intimidating. Now let's jump forward and look at some more description of this day of the Lord as Zephaniah describes it. Let's go to 115 and 116. This is a uh, somewhat of a long description if you look through the passage, but look at some of the things he calls it. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry, just like we saw, against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. So we see that the soldiers are out, the horns are blasting, the, the shouts are being called out to prepare the troops. as they're about to be invaded on the day of the Lord. So back to our verse in Joel 2, 1. He says, Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. One can imagine the fear that struck the hearts of the people when they heard the sounding of these alarms. And that's exactly what Joel is calling for here. A catastrophic disaster is about to come upon us. The people are to be terrified. 
for the day the Lord is coming. This is not just any military invasion. This one is directed by the Lord himself. And that would be the scariest of all. The last line, surely it is near. No doubt that day of disaster is about to fall upon them. Have you ever been in a situation where you kind of scared yourself? You're talking about something that's going to happen and or something scary and then suddenly something moves or something falls and it makes you all jump. One time when I was discussing with my mother about the possibility of a nuclear attack, this is many years ago, we were, hadn't given it much thought, but now and then it comes up on the news or something comes up that makes you think about it and you think, well, those years are probably past. But then you're reminded that major nations have nuclear weapons pointing at each other. And we were discussing this one winter night and then suddenly the siren goes off. The city siren goes off and it's loud. And then we thought, what in the world is happening and let me tell you it really startled you what do you do what is causing them to set off this siren well there was nothing on the news there was nothing that we heard outside and what I came to conclude was that there had been a big change in the weather or the weather had gotten really cold and something had caused it to set off at that time at night but I got to experience what it was like to suddenly sense that uh, that uh, fear that runs through your heart when you hear those sirens go off where do you go what do you do uh, we don't have a a bomb shelter we had we had a shelter from the storms that's probably where we would go, but what do you do in something like this? And that's what's happening here is suddenly they see this military invasion come and they hear all these sounds and you can just hear parents grab their children and try to run to shelter and the father's having to run to the walls and the fear that runs through the hearts and minds of the people. That is something Joel wants these people to sense right now as they see these locusts that something much worse could come soon then Joel goes on to describe this <clears throat> day of the Lord similar to what we just saw in Zephaniah let me just pause for a moment and point this out if you've ever read through the prophets and I'm talking about basically any of them, any of them whether it be Isaiah or Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, Daniel, the uh, other 12 prophets, Joel being one of those, you're going to find three themes in most all of them. One is the theme of warning. Warning. And the reason there's warning going on because the people are in some state of disobedience. And with, the, with that warning, they'll start to get judgment. And what are they called to do every time? Repent. And if they repent, there's a promised restoration. But there's also a look to the future. A look to the future. And that is blessing. Sometimes that blessing will come in their lifetime. And there may be the next generation. But often this blessing is couched in terms of the future. And the day of judgment sometime refers to the future. 
So what I'm saying is you have these same things happen. Uh, there's usually some sort of judgment. Um, and then there's some blessing that follows. And you see these patterns over and over again throughout the prophets. Because the basic message of the prophets is for you people to get right with God. And if you don't, discipline's coming. <clears throat> Let me just ask you. Now this is sort of a quiz. Why would this same pattern occur over and over with these prophets? The warning, if they don't, if they don't turn back, they're judged. If they do turn back, there's restoration and there's blessing because they are under the Mosaic Covenant. <clears throat> now, what gets interesting, this is something I pointed out in the book of Daniel, is that, as you know, the timeline for Israel was put to a stop to be picked up at the end of uh, this era in the seven year tribulation where they live out the last seven years. And at that time, they go through judgment. At the end of that judgment comes in the blessing. So what's interesting is, even though the Mosaic Covenant isn't in the same effect as it was in the days of the Old Covenant, there still appears to be this final seven years to, to run out. And we would probably call it discipline. As we examine those passages, you can see for yourself. But at the same time, they're actually under the New Covenant. So it appears that they're getting the last seven years from the judgment of the uh, Mosaic Covenant, even though they can turn to Christ and enter the New Covenant. Well, let's go back to our verse in verse 2. But I want you to see those themes that constantly occur over and over. They're fairly obvious. <clears throat> and by the way, some of that occurs in our lives, too. We, we sin, we get disciplined. If we confess and repent, we're restored, and there's blessing. Let me put verse 2 up there again. It's quite long. Here we go. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like dawn is spread over the mountains, a great and powerful army of people. There's never been anything like it from ancient times and after it. It will not happen again for years of generation to generation to come. That last phrase is a little confusing. It's more literal. But I wanted you to see what it actually says, and then we'll explain it. Four different words are used to describe the darkness. And notice that in the first two lines. Darkness, gloom, a day of clouds, Thick darkness. These words are used to describe this wrath that is coming. And in fact, it's used similarly with other prophets like Amos and Zephaniah and even Isaiah. Three of these words that I've translated here, darkness, gloom, and clouds, are the same three words used for the presence of the Lord on Mount Sinai with Moses. So we see the Lord's presence also in this description. Also, the two words, darkness and gloom, are used for the plague of supernatural darkness over Egypt in Exodus 10.22. And they're often associated with dread and death. The gloom idea brings that out. Well, the next line says, like dawn is spread over the mountains, a great and powerful people. People is the actual Hebrew word, but 
The idea is army. Have you ever sat uh, at the foot of some mountains or within some mountains and watched the sunrise come over and suddenly light them up? If you ever watched the sun rise it, over mountains like that, it, it spreads very quickly so that the mountain basically just lights up. And you get the idea of how fast these armies are moving. They're advancing. That's the idea. And then the description that there's never been anything like it. There's never been anything like it. From ancient times and after it, it will not happen again for years of generation to generation to come. The idea is that this is something that's, that's never occurred before. The great speed and thoroughness of this army has not been, has not happened in the history of Israel. And it's said as though it's not going to happen again. But it will. But the idea is that it's something that they should realize is very rare. Now, let's not be too disturbed by the way Joe uses phrases <clears throat> and what we call in literature hyperbole. To describe how efficient and destructive this army is. The point is he want the point that he wants to get across is how fast and efficient and powerful this army is. Think of it. The invading army is from the Lord. Its objective is to destroy, and that is what will happen. And that is what will really happen when the real army of soldiers come in with their horses and chariots and weapons of war. Verse 3 describes their devastation. Before them fire devours, behind them a blazes or I should say blazes burn or blaze burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, behind them a desolate waste, and nothing at all escapes them. Here we see the terms for fires, which indicate judgment again, and then the real possibility of literal fires in the fields, the houses, and the city. See how Joel uses a before and after contrast. Notice he says, the land is like the Garden of Eden before them. So as the soldiers approach the land, it's lush, it's beautiful, it's unscarred. And then once the army passes through, it leaves only a desolate waste. and nothing at all escapes them. So after they pass through, it's a desolate waste. Nothing's left. This would be true of the locusts when it comes to the crops, and plants, and orchards, as well as an army. In verse 4, Joel describes the appearance of the locusts this is interesting. Verse 4, they have the appearance of horses. They gallop like war horses. Here we see him even, even getting an uh, advanced picture of what the, uh, these little critters look like. You ever get close up to a grasshopper or locust, you see their big heads protruding forward and their big legs, their dominating legs, and similar to a horse, their head is up and they're forward and they have their Big legs, and here they're described as advancing in a war gallop, fearing nothing, nothing stopping them. Have you ever seen 
Uh, well, in some movies they have it this way where these horses just charge fearless, not afraid of a spear getting thrust into their chest. Verse 5 gives us the sounds of advancing troops and their mobile units. I use a rather modern term here for chariots and battle wagons and so on, but verse 5, with a noise as of chariots, they leap over the tops of the mountains like the sound or the crackling of fire consuming stubble as a mighty people, an army drawn up for battle. So as the locusts move and hop and swarm and buzz, it's very noisy, it's loud, it's like the sounds of chariots and horses moving through the hills, the thundering hooves, the wheels of chariots grinding on the roads and trails and rocks and over the hills. Then there's the rattles, the clamoring of shields and swords and armor as they not together, shaking. Then the phrase, like the sound or crackling of fire consuming stubble. Those who observed or been present where locusts have been very active speak of the sound they make. And they describe, they describe it as the crackling of a bush burning The next phrase is a mighty people, an army drawn up for battle. Note the as beginning the last line. It is not a mighty army. It is as a mighty army. So we're describing the locusts with the noise and the appearance of an invading army. The last line describes them as drawing up for battle. They're lining up for the attack. We call that in the military getting on line. Or you would line up abreast, across, ready to move forward. In verse 6, we see the reaction of the people. Before it, referring to the army, the people that's in the plural, writhe in fear, all their faces turn pale. The blood drains from their face at the sight of certain destruction and possible death. To see thousands of troops lined up with their shining armor, their pointed spears, their arrows ready to be flung, it's a scary sight. You're about to be destroyed. And you look at your little army and your little defense and say, how can we stop that? In this case, they couldn't. In verse 7, we see more of the locusts being described as a real military invasion. We're going to see them in a battle charge, ready to swarm over, under, and through everything in their path. Verse 7. <clears throat> like warriors they charge as men of battle soldiers they scale the wall as each marches advances in his line and they do not deviate from their paths here we see the locusts scaling the walls as easily and as well trained troops who have the equipment to do so each marches in his line. They advance, advance, advance. And they do not go to the left or right. They don't deviate from their path. They go the direction they're commanded. This gives the appearance of discipline in the ranks as they move forward in battle, not deviating from their assigned objectives. In verse 8, we see more pictures of frontline soldiers. <clears throat> As Joel continues to describe in some detail, these locusts, as they picture also a threatening army, they do not crowd each other. 
each marches straight ahead. When they burst through the defenses, they do not break ranks. So here we see the leading troops keeping proper intervals, avoiding congestion, or hindering each other's advance. Troop movement is an important aspect of military maneuvers and strategy. You don't want confusion. Everyone has their assigned spot. Everyone goes to their assigned spot at the time they're supposed to do it, at the pace they're supposed to do it. <clears throat> you keep your lines even so there's no break in the lines. So you hit them with as much force as possible again and again and again. Most of us have seen those movies where we see them lined up with swords and spears and you almost always see them on a line and then behind that line's another line and then that line another line and that's what happens they hit them one line after the other and they don't want to break ranks so they break ranks there's a weakness so here we see the locusts are viewed like soldiers moving orderly steadily perfectly as they should and as they break through all the defenses, nothing is stopping them. Nothing is slowing them down. Not themselves, they keep their ranks or the defenses. Whatever obstacles are out in front of them, they keep pushing forward. Advancing, advancing, advancing. Verse 9, they arrive at the city. They rush into the city. They're not even slowed down. They run on or scale up the walls. The wall, they climb up into the houses. They go through the houses like a thief. <clears throat> Here we are to visualize the locusts. Again, portraying an army. Rapidly moving to the city going over the walls, scaling the walls with their ladders and equipment, into the houses, onto the rooftops. In the ancient world of walled cities, the houses were often built up against the walls so they could jump right over the wall and then on down into the rooftops. So from the scaling the walls, from verse 7, they move right along the walls to the rooftops, from house to house, building to building, missing nothing missing no one they would flush out the homes whether they were going to take people captive or uh, destroy them they're described as going through the windows like a thief like a professional thief who can quickly and smoothly break the windows if we look carefully at verse 10 we can see a reference to three events that are coming Three events that actually are referred to as we look at these, well, actually this single verse. Before them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars withdraw or lose their brightness. Now, I said there are, are three events here that are referred to. Let me read through this one more time. Before then the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and their stars withdraw or lose their brightness. That's the idea. They lose their brightness. What are the three events that we are referring to here? Well, two we've been talking about. First event is the locust invasion. So the people see a preview on a small scale of what the second event is. And that's actually an army military invasion. Now these first two events are historical.
One has happened, one will happen. But as we look back, we can say it's history. Let's describe them a little bit. The Logos invasion, to sum it up. The hopping and movement of waves and waves of locusts give the appearance of the earth moving. As it says, the earth quakes. Some say who observe this, it even causes a dizzying effect on those who are looking because it's as if the earth is moving. The heavens tremble. That's the appearance of the sky. As you see swarms and swarms of locusts darkening the sky, covering a huge portion of it. It's as if the heaven is moving. The heavens are moving. The sky is shaking. And then we see in the last two lines, the sun and the moon are blacked out as reports of the past say that locusts are so thick they block the light of the sun in the day and the moon at night. And of course, neither are the stars seen. So to bring in the second event of the army would picture an invading army, horses and chariots and wagons and war equipment and foot soldiers. Loud and at a distance, they gradually move closer like the sounds and sights of an earthquake. If you've ever been in an earthquake, and I've been in a few myself, you hear the sound of the rumble and it gets louder and louder until it's there. Now the third event is future. And that is the event of the day of the Lord. Now when I say the day of the Lord, not just the day, okay, in contrast to the day, all right, up here is the day of the Lord. This is the day. I am referring to the future day when Christ returns himself. We would call it the second advent from our viewpoint. The second advent or the second coming. This is the eschatological day. E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, long word, eschatological day. The final days of what we call the tribulation, when the armies of the world are surrounding Jerusalem during the final big battle of Armageddon. It is then that there was earthquakes, real earthquakes, and the cosmos, the world, the, the organization of the world, including the sun and the sky and the moon, supernatural things happen. There's a supernatural darkness during the judgments shortly before the Lord returns. So, there are three events that are pictured here. And one looks forward to the day of the Lord. Earlier I talked about the different themes that the, any of the prophets have in common. And this is one of them also. The day of the Lord. And then some of them go into the blessing and including the millennial kingdom. Verse 11, it's if, it is if we're on the battle scene itself. We're getting first-hand reports because we're there. The Lord gives forth his voice before his army. Surely his military encampment is extremely large, for mighty in size is the one army who executes his commands. Indeed, the day of the Lord is awesome and very terrifying. Who can endure it? It's a pretty long verse, too. First of all, the Lord gives forth, that's the more literal Hebrew, the word forgive is 
a common word we see, Nathan, Nathan, pronounced Nathan, give, put, set. In this context, he's giving forth his voice. So we usually translate it something like utter, which we really don't use too much in modern English. Uh, but you will see some of the translations use utter, or they use the word thunder. And that's not a new concept. Uh, other scripture refers to similar things. But the idea is that behind, uh, behind this, what's going on, the Lord is giving forth his voice in a loud noise. Uh, in this context, it would be like the command shouts of a military commander. In fact, it's used for thunder in, in uh, the heavens, as we would have it in our day too, thunder in the heavens. In Psalm 77, 17, it's like the heavens gives forth its voice, which we would interpret as thunder. But look at Psalm 18, 13. The Lord thundered in the sky. The sovereign one shouted. That's a net translation. I don't bring that one up here too often, but it's a very good translation. In Jeremiah 4.16, it's used for a war cry. So here we see the Lord himself giving the command at the head of his army. And this further confirms that this is the Lord's judgment. He is commanding, in this case, the locusts as he would be in charge of the invading army. The next phrase, surely his military encampment is extremely large. Now the word encampment can refer to the army itself or the camp. The point is that it's the Lord who's commanding this huge army. It goes on to describe them as for mighty in size. Let me put the phrase up here. Is the one, referring to the army, who executes his command. This describes how large the army of the Lord is. The idea is that the larger the army, the more forceful is the command. If you've ever been in the presence of a... a uh, a military group, especially a large size, let's say it's battalion size, and the commander will give the order, and then you start hearing the commands, battalion, attention, and then they'll go company, each company, company A, company B, and I'll be saying attention, and then background you'll hear even further, platoon, you see, first platoon, second platoon, and you'll hear these echoes carry off in the distance of the orders. So the first command is quite loud because it's right in front of you. The second and third and so on become more distant as the troops are further away and their commands are further away. So here the idea is there's a very loud command voice. It indicates how large the army is. Then we had the phrase, indeed, the day of the Lord is awesome. I like the word awesome here. The Hebrew would say something like great, but in this context, awesome in our modern day language, it fits quite well. And very terrifying. Who can endure it? Emphasize the point how horrible and frightening this day will be. It's a powerful day. It's a, the word for awesome again can mean powerful, great. Who can endure it brings out the idea of just how unbearable it is. Now, let me do one of my little pauses, and, which actually isn't a pause, but it's more like an insert. Let me point out that as believers, the faithful, we have no reason to fear. Yes, the situations are intimidating. 
Yes, there's going to be a lot of death and destruction. But just like a young Christian, uh, young man who would go into the military, God will protect you just as much as he will out there as he will on the freeways. Or at home. Later on, we will see in chapter 3 that during this time, the Lord is the believer's refuge. And Joel 2, we come to that famous passage, those who call upon him will be saved. So I point this out that later on in the passage to, to reassure you that as faithful Christians, God has you in his hand. I mean, after all, the punishment is for the unbeliever, for the rebellious, for those who have been unfaithful to the covenant in Joel's day. But for believers, he has another purpose. And for that, I refer you to the book of Daniel. The Lord has his own people hauled off to Babylon in captivity. That's where most all the remnant goes. Well, in our next lesson, we will see how there is still time for the people of Israel or Judah, depending on the one's interpretation of this particular event, there's still time to repent and turn back to the Lord. Let's pray. Well, Father, what an awesome thing we've seen here with your description of this time period and also of not only the locusts of the army, but also the future. And Lord, as we read these things, help us learn not only the lessons, but also the application. So that in our own lives, we know that as your people, we are taken care of. But at the same time, we can expect judgment when there's great sin and no repentance. So we ask for your strength and the confidence that we need in the power of the Spirit to endure. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.